all. Thank you so much, Laura, and also uh, Dom Van Zant, who is also fine art faculty at Riverland College. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to exhibit in the beautiful gallery. Um, in some ways, I'm, I'm disappointed to not be in the gallery right now with the exhibit, um, talking about the work in person and, and interacting with you um, face to face, you know, that always brings a, a really nice um, energy to the work and uh, to us as people, but also, but um, the Zoom platform does have uh, the advantage of being able to include people that are um, in the broader world, right, beyond um, Austin. So, um, so that's, um, that's really nice. I'm grateful to be here with you all. And um, I'm particularly excited to be showing the work at Riverland because um, the title of the exhibit is Visioning Rural Iowa Through the Documentary Tradition, but the photographs are drawn from a seven year long documentary project that I worked on about my father's hometown in Belmond, Iowa, which is it's maybe 90 minutes from Austin. It's it's not far. It's um, in north central Iowa. So I feel like, um, you know, just even driving down to Austin from Minnesota, the landscape is is really similar. Right. So um, I think there are uh, similarities between a lot of similarities in the um, in perhaps in the towns and the roles that people play and um, some of the socioeconomic dynamics that are at work. So, so Rev Riverland is a, a great venue um, for the project. And I hope also that um, the students in your class, Laura, will have some questions for me. I mean, everybody, of course, is welcome to ask questions. And I hope you do have have some, but particularly the students at Riverland um, have some, or, or you know, feedback or impressions, things that um, that struck them about the work. So, and because that is uh, super interesting for me to hear. Um, so, so let's go ahead and get started with my. Um, my presentation. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, as Laura mentioned, um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking first about the Farm Security Administration photographers and about how they, um, about the, the tradition of social documentary photography in the United States. And I, I think you'll see once we get into to looking at at uprooted um, in the slides here that I'm showing that um, they had a big effect on how I thought about the project. They definitely set a precedence for me in, um, in thinking about the work. And so first I'm going to start off um, showing some work by this Farm Security Administration um, photographers. I'm gonna talk about what that program was um, why it was started, and um, and then I'll show some pictures from from Uprooted, and um, I'll talk a little bit about my process, um, about how I approached the project, um, how it unfolded, um, and then you know depending on on how we are for time, I know there's we're planning to have about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So uh, depending on how long I ramble, I will um, potentially get in also to talking about things like visual language, which I think especially, I know Laura is teaching drawing at Riverland, um, they have painting. So things like visual language, you know, even though photography is a different visual medium, there are, um, a lot of similarities. And indeed, before photography came into being, um, drawing and painting were the, the ways that um, visually that ideas were um, conveyed and sculpture too, of course. But, you know, I'm a 2D person. So I, I tend to sometimes, um, sorry, uh, sculpture people. <laughs> sometimes I don't always include that in my um, conversation. So um, and then, you know, we may get into style a little bit um, because Clearly, I made some 
uh, stylistic decisions, especially with the portraits um, in terms of how I um, set them up and how I lit them. And there was a lot of thought that went into that part of the process. And I think artist talks are, you know, this is why we come to artist talks so we can learn a little bit about, about that. So, um, uh, Uprooted is a really meaning, a very meaningful project to me because of the fact that my father grew up in this town in Belmond and I visited um, as a child a lot, spent a lot of time on the farm. My grandparents were farmers um, and they were, uh, they had what, you know, we would refer to as a family farm, you know, 160 acres when the Homestead Act was first established it was 160 acres was the plot that um, farmers got and that was the size of their of their farm so when I think about family farm these are this is how I I tend to think about things and um, the project has multiple layers and um, I think the showing the farm security administration uh, photographs will help add to that dimension. And then also um, in a broader sense, um, the metaphor of uprooted, um, you know, we're talking, thinking about plants and pulling them out, you know, when, you know, when we uproot a plant, um, but also thinking about migration um, of people and, you know, people moving from one place to another. Why do people move from one place to another and how does it feel to be without roots? So, so these are um, some things that I'm, I'm considering when I'm thinking about uprooted. So, um, and I haven't jumped not quite to the FSA pictures yet, but here's another, um, you know, agriculture um, important. So um, harvest on grandma's farm. Now in my talk, I want to um, just discuss a little bit uh, what, um, how photography can function as a social document and um, a social documentary is a type of photography that records people and their social circumstances. And often the pictures are used in a persuasive way. So, um, and that is particularly true with the, the Farm Security Administration photographs. And, um, and this also, for me, inspires um, the ideas about how photography can be used to affect social change. So this photograph is an example um, from the Farm Security Administration. Uh, young Iowan with horses purchased through, re through a rehabilitation loan. And um, so there was a program called the um, Rehabilitation um, Act. And so, they were, you know, this is during the, the Dust Bowl era. Um, tenant farmers um, were, you know, really at a loss and were being relocated from place to place. And so um, the government had programs to, to help people. And the government also photographed people that were uh, recipients of um, the the aid that they received. So this is an example. Um, and this one actually is from Iowa. So that's why I, I included it here. Um, oops. So when this happens, there we go. Now, this picture is not from the Farm Security Administration. Um, this one is by Lewis Hine. And he was a sociologist. Um, he taught um, in New York City at the, the university that's now called the New School. And he used photography to um, document the living conditions of people in tenements in New York City, but then also um, the labor conditions of children um, uh, along in, in New York, but also along the the Eastern seaboard. So um, in this particular image, 
this is um, in the cotton mill. Um, he was photographing the children working. You know, sometimes children would be as young as five or six. Um, he also photographed a lot in mines, you know, children who are working in coal mines, um, children in New York City that were, you know, maybe five or six years old selling newspapers, um, these types of things. So he um, took his pictures that he made and presented them to Congress and was able to influence con Congress to pass stricter child labor laws. So he, um, this was before the Farm Security Administration, but um, it was definitely, and he did not work for the government, um, but he was definitely um, influential in um, the in the activities of the FSA. So um, the Farm Security Administration was a US government photography project um, that was created by President Franklin Roosevelt in 1935. And initially the project documented recipients of cash loans made by the Resettlement Administration. And um, the Resettlement Administration provided aid to poor rural Americans who were forced off their tenant farms during the depression and the Dust Bowl years. So uh, I feel like um, I should talk, um, just give a little bit of background information about what a tenant farm was or is. Um, this is a situation where there is a landowner and this is particularly true in the South. Um, there's a landowner and then the landowner allows people to live on the farm for a portion of the crop, right? So it's also called sharecropping. And um, during the, the Great Depression, um, not only was there, you know, prices were very low, um, also there was um, what they call the dust bowl years or a, a terrible drought. So farmers were not able to make any money and they consequently weren't able to pay the landowners. So many were forced off their land. And it was really, it was a, an epidemic, right? It was a horrible, um, it was a crisis. And uh, so Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt set up the Farm Security Administration in order to provide aid. And, um, and then the photographers that worked for the Farm Security Administration were in charge of documenting um, people who received the aid, but then also living conditions of people who were tenant farmers, um, who had been forced off their land, who were migrant workers, um, basically people at the time who were living on the fringes of, um, of society. So um, Roy Stryker, he was the director of the Farm Security Administration and he was a former student and colleague of Lewis Hine and also that Roy Stryker was um, an economist. So he was not a photographer, but he was a, a director of the, um, the FSA. And um, so this picture, you know, I'm, it's hard for me to not talk about style because uh, in theory, documentary photographs aren't, you know, supposed to have a style. Um, sometimes people refer to documentary as a style, but, um, you know, if we're thinking about something as a document, we want to, um, of course, you have to use your own, always be a uh, suspect about what are we being told with our visual image, um, because photographs are used to persuade, right? But um, I look at this picture and I immediately think about Grapes of Wrath, um, both the book and the film. Um, I recently saw the film with Henry Fonda and I'm, I'm sure that um, the director and the cinematographer spent a lot of time looking at the FSA pictures um, before they shot it because, you know, this looks like it, it could be the Jode family, right? Except they were in a truck. So um, let's move on. So this is the most well-known image from the FSA 
um, era. And by the way, the FSA was in existence from 1935 to 1944. So um, this one is Migrant Mother by Dorothea Lang. And um, it's, I think it's really interesting, um, you know, thinking about it from a Western art point of view. Um, it definitely, um, it's echoing the Madonna archetype and um, in European art. And so this woman was in a labor camp, um, actually was sitting in a tent. And it's interesting to know that this picture has been retouched. So in 1936, even in 1936 and before, since the beginning of the inception of photography, photographers have been using different retouching techniques. This is not something that just happened with the advent of Photoshop. So in the original um, printed negative, you can see there's a hand holding back the, the flap of the curtain. So I, I think that's interesting to um, point out. But this image was reproduced in the San Francisco newspaper and resulted in um, directed aid to this particular migrant worker camp um, in Northern California. And uh, Ben Sean was another FSA photographer and he was trained as a painter and a printmaker. And he often thought of his pictures as studies for paintings. And I was really drawn to this picture because um, it reminds me of um, some of the French social realist painters um, in the composition and also in the, the subject matter. Um, so he considered his work as an FSA photographer to be a moral calling, um, showing the economic conditions of people who were forced to work for little wages. And um, so this one is from 1935. So Ben Sean um, traveled over the, around the South um, and the Midwest photographing um, rural people in the rural areas. And one thing also that I should mention about these photographs that I'm showing you, the Library of Congress, they're all owned by the, Ameri the, by the Library of Congress and anybody can download. I mean, it's like, uh, public domain. These images are in the public domain. So and there's an enormous um, uh, catalog of pictures. It's like all of the pictures that were um, archived for this project. So it's all online. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really a visual image geek. And uh, also that I'm always connecting in all of my projects, connecting the past to the present. So for me, it's just like a rabbit hole that I could get lost in for hours um, uh, looking at all of these pictures. So, so in case you are interested, you can, you can see them too. They're all out there, Library of Congress. Okay. Um, so these are also Arkansas <clears throat> sharecroppers. Um, and this was uh, photographed for the resettlement administration. Now, I wanted to also show some work by um, Gordon Parks because he was a pioneer in so many ways. And he, he was a, a Farm Security Administration photographer, although he joined later in 1942. And at this time, the FSA was focusing its attentions more on war efforts and also the urban poor. So the focus had shifted away from the plight of the, the rural, um, farmers. And so Gordon, Gordon Parks was um, very, uh, just a little bit of information about him, he had a very prolific career. He was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is uh, always an interesting fact. And he was a photojournalist. He was the first African American uh, to work for Life magazine, who is also a fashion photographer, a portrait photographer, and he was a filmmaker. So um, really had an illustrious career and was incredibly um, versatile. 
in this picture, um, which he also referred to as American Gothic, uh, shows a woman, a cleaning woman for um, the for government buildings in DC and um, showing the hidden labor and lives of African Americans. And he was often commissioned um, by life to um, photograph black families um, in the South, um, in addition to the work that he did for the FSA. And Walker L. Evans, it seems like Walker Evans is uh, one of the best known um, FSA photographers. He's known for his formalist compositions and for showing um, unexpected beauty in the everyday. And I got this, this digital image from the Library of Congress website and it looks like it's a, a scan or something or a, Anyway, it's, it's not a very high quality reproduction of the, this picture, but also that you can, there are so many different versions of this image. Um, it, this one also is, it's not as iconic as the migrant mother, but often when we're talking about FSA um, photographers and particularly portraits, this picture is shown. And it's interesting to go to the Library of Congress website and see all the different poses that, or just the subtle changes in her face that, um, and shifts, which as a portrait photographer, you know, this is what we do, but, you know, we know this picture so well, and it's interesting to, to visit the Library of Congress and see all the, the variations there are on this particular image. Anyway, um, this is Allie May Burroughs, um, wife of a cotton sharecropper. And he was, uh, Walker Evans was also known for showing the dignity of his subjects in the face of hardship. So um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful portrait in that regard. And here is another Walker Evans picture. I, I really was drawn to this one. This is also from the FSA. Um, he's known for his photographs of vernacular buildings. So um, country churches like this one, but also um, things like uh, signage, you know, or, or shops, exteriors of buildings and shops with, uh, you know, the old signs, the old time signs. So um, he's very uh, often recognized for that. But this one, you know, I am really drawn to things that are old and worn. And, um, and also I'm drawn to vernacular architecture. So this one was a great, uh, I thought was a really good segue um, into my project. Um, so talking about uprooted a little bit more, and I keep looking at my watch here um, to see how we're doing for time. Okay, so let's go ahead and shift. So of course in Iowa, there are, um, when you're driving through uh, the back roads, um, you see many old little country churches um, in Wisconsin too. It seems like in Minnesota, I haven't, seen as many. I'm not sure why that is, but um, little town halls, little country churches, and um, this uh, reminded me of, of those. So now we're shifting um, into my work on Uprooted, and um, so I was very interested in photographing Belmont because I had been away for 20 years and um, I started returning to um, address some, uh, some management of um, farmland. And I really was struck by how many things looked exactly the same 
you know, how, how nothing had really changed. But then the more that I learned about agriculture and, um, you know, about, about the town, the more I learned um, how much things in fact had changed. So I was really struck by that dichotomy and um, all of my photographic projects address connecting the past to the present in, in some way. So, um, you know, this is, um, it really, that really drew me in. And um, some of the things that had shifted um, were immigration, right? Um, which was very interesting to me because my family are German immigrants, right? And the, and the town was settled in the, the latter part of the, the 19th century by German immigrants. So, you know, again, this idea of migration um, comes into play for me. I was thinking about um, the new wave, the current wave of immigrants um, from, from Latin America. Um, and uh, I'm thinking about the population shift from rural areas to urban areas for employment reasons. And then also um, the shifts in agriculture from family farms to more large scale operations. And that these things were all, you know, pretty common knowledge in, in the mainstream media. Um, but I wanted to um, maybe get below the surface and um, also find a, a connection um, to some some truths um, that uh, universal truths, I could say. So I let's move ahead. I did at the beginning um, start by looking. I went to the um, the state of Iowa data library to get some demographic information about Wright County and. Um, because, you know, I heard a lot of, you know, I had a lot of anecdotal information, you know, things that stories that people would tell me um, that, you know, as I was meeting people, um, you know, things about like homelessness and poverty and, um, but also about, you know, the number of family farms that are left and um, uh, things like, uh, racial demographics. So I had a lot of anecdotal information, but I wanted to get a little bit, some, some figures so that I could sort of build my project around that um, in, it, as a way to, to try to keep it a little bit more um, based in fact, if that's at all possible, um, as a guiding I could just call it a guiding force for the project and in, in making decisions about what to photograph and what not to photograph. Um, and let's see, also wanting to create a portrait of the town um, in the 21st century as told through my experiences of the past. And after I had been photographing for probably about a year, I settled on the idea that it, in order to create a, a nice, full, well-rounded portrait that I could photograph all the different roles that exist in the town. <clears throat> so, all the different uh, socioeconomic types of jobs, roles, um, the different roles that people play in town. So, so I came up with a list and, um, and used that to also to help guide the subjects that I picked. And in my photographic practice, I, I consider myself a portrait photographer. I gravitate towards photographing people, but when I started working on Uprooted, I was really <clears throat> doing more landscapes and, and buildings, um, looking at the, 
um, just really drawn to the beauty. And, um, you know, I tell my students all the time that, you know, follow your bliss, right? And that is all about how my projects get started. So when I, I did not start working on this project with the idea that, oh, I'm gonna, you know, make this seven year documentary and I'm gonna call it Uprooted. It just, the projects don't come fully formed. Um, and so uh, it started by by landscapes and actually I'm, I'm not really showing any landscapes in my, in my presentation here, but there are many landscapes in the project. Um, but um, as I, continued, kept going back to make more pictures, um, you know, after landscapes and buildings, I started photographing um, farmers and agriculture because that was the part that had changed the most from my perspective. And, um, and through that, that was sort of the doorway to get into more about the community and about the people. So uh, let's advance it. Okay. Um, so here are here are some farmers. One thing that I endeavored to do in photographing my portraits was to make them pretty straightforward, right? I'm trying to avoid the emotional tug or being overly aesthetic with the portraits. Um, and I've had some flack for that, but um, you know, these are the, the these are the decisions that we make. Um, the way that the subjects are posed, that they're positioned, the lighting, it's all very intentional. And I'm using the environment that the subjects are positioned in to say something about who they are and what their role is um, in, in the town and in life, what they do. And um, another picture of a farming couple. So I will use often use my sequencing in order to make conclusions or comparisons between um, or just to you know build out the the visual language or the dialogue um, the narrative that the the images are creating um, so uh, churches you know lots of many churches in the town and um, thinking about, so I have at this point, I have completed the project. I finished it um, 2019 was when I, I felt like I had had a well-rounded um, portrait of the town. And um, there are, I think 12 churches. So um, decisions about how many, how many, churches or pastors do I include in the in the project the finished body of work is 75 pictures so um, and then Emmanuel Reformed is the church where my grandparents attended and this is the church Lutheran church organist um, and she had been doing it for 50 years. I hear she's no longer um, in service now, but. And this is my cousin who is an accounting clerk. So you'll notice in the titles, I normally mention what their role is, but. Um, you know, sometimes in the titles also, I will make reference to like the family that, you know, I do have a, a connection that is beyond just, um, you know, this 
person that I'm photographing. With the project as well, I was really wanting to get beyond uh, polarizing dialogue. And so that is another reason for posing the subjects in a similar way, right? And having them be similar sizes within the frame um, so that I could hopefully level out some of them, those hot buttons. But also um, it's challenging um, to be making photographs um, as an outsider because of the power relationship that exists between the photographer and the people that are being photographed, right? So I really try to avoid looking at people as being exotic or different. Although, um, you know, as humans, clearly we, we have um, differences one from one another. So, you know, how can I, give agency to my subjects? How can I um, allow them to, you know, just to, again, try to balance out that power dynamic a little bit, um, even though it, I don't think that it's 100% possible, but, you know, being, having that awareness, I think is really, is really important. Uh, tire mechanic. So Lewis Hine has a really iconic picture that of a a man working on a, a big tire, and it's been riffed on by so many photographers. Um, Annie Leibovitz um, did one with a I don't remember who the fam famous athlete or somebody. You know, she riffed on this Lewis Hines Lewis Hine photo. Um, Anyway, you know, we're always, always being influenced by, by other artists and other photographers. And I'm thinking, you know, thinking about style, um, you know, and lighting again, um, and how can I you know, avoid, you know, thinking about aesthetics, right? And how can I keep the pictures from being purely about the aesthetics or, or that balance between, between style and, and subject and, and meaning? Um, so these are things that, that I'm, also thinking about, you know, I want the pictures to be interesting and to be compelling, but um, want them to to be, uh, you know, I guess a document in that way. Here's waitress. One thing that I have noticed in Belmont is there's a lot of paneling indoors. Um, so um, going back to, you know, I guess it's a, a time, right? A time period, um, a style. Uh, I, you know, it's about my, my preoccupations too. Honestly, I, I am really, drawn to paneling, um, sort of strange, but I have my weird little preoccupation. So yeah, there's a lot of paneling and um, I've had some, I've had criticism also about the project that saying that the interiors, they don't look very prosperous or um, they look old and yeah, that's, yeah, I think that that's true. Um, I, and I, I wonder, um, you know, these are conversations I have with myself, you know, do I need to be um, including more uh, prosperity or images that are showing, um, showing more prosperity? 
So, um, but then here we'll just come to uh, Gary, the one of the attorneys in town, no paneling in this picture, but I think there could be, you know, I think there could very easily be paneling here. And, and also that, you know, this is an interpersonal thing that, you know, he's really a kind of a smiling and gregarious person. So, and I've tried to photograph people, you know, I, I didn't want him to smile. I, and I, as you've noticed, nobody is really smiling in any of the pictures. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, what, what does that, that say about, um, you know, how would this picture change if he were smiling? Um, these are things that, that I'm always thinking about. And I see that we're at 145 and I just have a, a couple pictures left on here. Um, so we've got the Paula, the fourth grade teacher. It, the details are really interesting to me. And this is why seeing photographs as prints, as opposed to seeing them on a computer screen makes so much difference. You know, being able to see them in the gallery and see them, um, see the detail. Um, although I, I don't think this one is printed in the gallery. Um, this one's a newer, a newer picture, um, but um, there's a lot of rich detail here. Um, so, you know, you've got a little, got an iPad, um, you know, I was really struck by this, you know, like the emojis, like this is a thing in the classroom. So for me, uh, the prosperity was really shown through, um, people that are at their, at their farms, um, at their large operations. And this is the, the grain elevator in town. And that is it for my presentation. And I put my Instagram handle on here too, if you want to, to follow me. So. Great, thank you so much, Christine. Um, I have a bunch of questions from my students. Okay, great. Let's hear it. Uh, and also I was going to say, if anybody has questions, um, you can put them in the chat and, and then we can, we can get to them. So um, we visited the show a couple of days ago and amassed a bunch of questions. So I'm just kind of pulling what seems to be a representative <laughs> amount of, of like, what are kind of the more popular questions. So. Um, do you feel like the motivation behind the project was personal or for you, was it educational? Ah, you know, those are, they're overlapping for me. You know, I have, I'm a very curious person by nature. And anytime I, I delve into a photo project, it's usually because I want to find out more about something. And that was definitely the case here. So, um, so I would say it was both educational and personal, but I got a huge education. I mean, I learned so much about rural, rural communities, about, um, about really the fabric of the community and how they support each other. Um, so, you know, it was all really a, a learning experience for me, but then also about agriculture. I learned a ton about agriculture, which, um, you know, about contemporary agriculture, which I really um, didn't know much, especially how technology um, is, plays such a big role in agriculture today. Um, another question we had, what kind of camera do you use? Yes. So I use, when I started the project, I was using a four by five film camera. So a large format, it's like the old fashioned, you know, it takes sheet film that's four inches by five inches. And you've got the, the hood that goes over the, 
the back. Um, and some of the earliest pictures were done with that camera. So this one, for example, um, and also uh, this one. So early on, I was using my four by five and I, I liked that a lot, but it's cost prohibitive. And also there's the, the piece about turnaround time and um, it just wasn't very practical. Um, I had to send my film to Portland, Oregon to be processed and it was expensive. And so I, I shifted um, to digital and I was using a Nikon D800, so DSLR. And lights, lots of lights. Um, kind of uh, tagging along with something you brought up, why do most of the people have serious faces, serious expressions on their face? Was that on purpose? It sounds like it was, but maybe you can expand on that for us. Yes, I feel like when people smile, you know, we have the whole thing about say cheese, you know, um, it's about putting on a mask. And I didn't want that. So I felt like people can be more accessible um, when they have more of a neutral facial expression. So which I think neutral in because you know America is a very smiley culture, you know. Um, so you know we even have this thing now that you know we say about women, right? If they're not smiling, it's RBF, right? Resting bitch face. Sorry, it's like, you know, I don't think we say that about men. Anyway, um, so I, I, I just I think about them as being more neutral and as opposed to. You know, I don't want them to look angry or to look happy, just sort of like neutral. Um, another question we got, how did you get the shot for the firework after the County Fair Rodeo in 2014? Um, how did you capture it? Yes, I used a tripod and I, you know, with fireworks, you have to take lots and lots of pictures. So, but you, you, if your shutter speed is too long, then you will just, you won't get much. So it's about experimenting a little bit with different shutter speeds and, and then, and taking a lot of photos in order to, to get a capture that, that looks good. What made you want to be a photographer? Ah. I am not very a good big at drawing. Question. We're, we, we, don't, we don't hold back here. Yeah. I, you know, I studied visual arts and I was all about visual communication. But honestly, I am not that skilled at drawing or, you know, conveying things in a realistic way and which was what I wanted to do. So photography, um, really was a great combination of visual imagery and also a way to tell a story um, that was more manageable for me. So um, I'm really interested in storytelling and in narrative and in communication also. And I'm also really interested in the overlap between art and communication and, um, and how sometimes, sometimes it's one thing and sometimes it's the other, but then sometimes it can be a little bit of both. So um, those are all of my, my preoccupations. Also, you know, having a camera is a really great way. It's a little bit like a passport, you know? It's a, a great way to explore and to investigate. So it's a great way to meet people and to talk to people and to learn, which was how I, um, how I learned about the town, you know, was by, because I had to, you know, I had to connect with all of these people. I had to, um, you know, if, 
of course, some of the people are family members, but that's just a few of them, right? But I had to make contact. Um, either they were people that I met on the street or they were, you know, friend of a friend or do you know somebody who does this? Or, you know, I would sometimes go into businesses and just ask, you know, explain what I'm up to and then just ask if I could make some portraits. So it's a, a really great way to get to know people and to get to know a place. That's a long answer. Cool. No, that was great. Um, yeah. Sort of, I think in a way dovetailing on that, what emotions do your photographs convey to you? Which of all your pictures that you've taken made a emotional impact on you? Or maybe which, you know, has a, that comes to mind, had a decisive emotional impact on you? Ah, yes. That is, that's true. That is no holds barred. Um, let's, you know, the, that would be probably be the ones that are the most personal. And um, I feel like I should pop up, maybe pop over to my website. Um, doo, doo, doo. Oh, I said I was going to queue it up ahead of time and I didn't. Um, okay. Can you see my website right now? Not yet. Okay. All right. Let me, let me do this. Um, okay. All right. Here we go. Okay. I am thinking the biggest impact would be I think it's this one, um, which is included in the in the show in at Riverland, and you know the the feeling of you know it's about socializing, it's about connecting, it's about celebrating. But this picture is really lonely to me, you know? Um, you know, it's about, it's a little bit about being a little bit isolated, but also um, just about like dancing like nobody's watching, right? Which I love, um, so. And there's panel, there's paneling in it. I love it. We're paneling. Um, we have two more, two more questions. Okay. okay. One is how did you get such a good, almost eerie yet calm lighting in the New Year's Eve 2013 church parking lot picture? Ah, yes. Okay. Um, that is right. This one. Um, and I think it's the color, right? This is the color of, I don't know what type of light this is, but that, you know, it, so our eyes color correct, right? That's something that our eyes do. Our eyes just automatically have a, like a built-in white balance. So if I were to look at the scene, it would look more white because of the snow, it, maybe not totally white, but it wouldn't look this green. So um, and then, you know, it's just like um, a high sensitivity on my, my shutter or on my ISO. So it's like turned up really high so that it can be really sensitive and catch all the details in the low light. And then also in the sky um, in the back here, which I think also contributes to the, the eeriness of it. And then also, um, I mean, I'm assuming that this was a technical question, you know, about, and I didn't, I mean, it was so cold out this night. It was below zero and it was windy. I mean, and this is a place with windmills. It is windy, right? In Belmont, it is just windy. And so, and it was cold and I did not have a tripod. I was, you know, kind of, it's kind of amazing when things work out, but um, so it had a faster shutter speed, but just a really, um, a lot of sensitivity on my, um, on my ISO in order to catch the subtlety. 
Okay, and last question. Um, after 10 years, looking back to these pictures, what do you think you're gonna feel? 10 years from now, looking back? Oh, that is a good question. Um, you know, even now, because I started it and I started going down in 2012. And so that is, is almost been almost 10 years, but um, you know, time is always um, a great um, way to um, judge. Time is a good judge, right? Um, I, I feel like I notice different things when I come back after being away for a while, when I come back to the photographs and, um, and I think that's also a, a strength. The ones that I can come back to and see something different in are, are ones that are for me standing the test of time. And, and that's true of any artwork, I think, whether it's mine or somebody else's, if I'm able to come back to it and notice something new or, or feel a little bit differently about something, um, that, that that's really a powerful, um, a powerful thing. But, you know, it, I think that's the only answer I have. I'm not sure how, if I will feel, it's hard to know. Will I feel more, um, I mean, probably wonder, you know, like where are these, where are some of these people now? I mean, some of them, I know where they are, but um, some of them I don't. And that I think is a, a big a question, you know, where are some of the people now? Um, do you have, does anybody else have any questions that they wanna to throw out there? All right, well, I just wanna say just a big thank you from Riverland and from myself for the beautiful show. Like I said, it is open through next Monday, 10 to six, Monday through Friday, if you wanna visit. And you can also see, uh, you can see here, a big selection of the work on the website. So thank you so much, Christine. Round of applause. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been my pleasure. And um, it's. I wish that uh, I could be down there with you and your class, um, but another time perhaps. Okay, thanks everybody for participating. And yes, and thanks everyone for coming. And have, have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>